as well, where he's going to give a bit longer presentation than we've had before. And, um, and we'll finish as usual with questions. Um, so without further ado, I am going to turn it over to uh, Conrad Wolfram, who is the CEO of Wolfram Europe and uh, a well-known figure to those of us in the tech community. Great. It's very kind of you to invite me, and nice, nice to see everyone. Thanks for the uh, for the nice introduction. I will, I will zip through fast here. What I um, want to talk about really is uh, the future of education in an AI age in which machines are increasingly intelligent, and what this means for, in a sense, what the human needs to learn. And uh, I'm just waiting for my screen for some reason has deciding not to share again it's uh, mm -hmm. before but let me try uh seeing if this time it it feels happier about the prospect um quite why it's funny it seems a bit uh unhappy about sharing it's, the share button is um, uh let's try once again here um let's share the entire screen For some reason the share button is is uh, sort of out out of action um, so I'm not quite sure why that's the case. Uh, it's these uh, these Google things that don't work. That's frustrating. Um, hold on just a second. Let me have one more go. I kind of need this. Uh... Right. Now, why is the share button not cooperating here? Um, think you're already sharing something? Don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> no. Uh, let me... Uh, it worked let me try sharing a window, but that's not really what I want to do. Uh, oh, okay. It seems to want to share a window. So let me, I might have to go that. I'm just going to try once again, given that it's now happy with the idea of a window. Uh, let me see if I can get it to share the whole thing. Ah, oh, here we go. Okay. Let's see if that works. Okay. With any luck, you now can see my screen. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me continue where I left off. Um, <laughs> So fixing education for the AI age, and, and the sort of the byline to this is let's not let humans, uh, let's not let humans sort of miss out in this. And the question I really want to start with is, you know, the world has changed. We all know that. We're sort of tech people, and we understand the world has changed, and it's changed because we have massive amounts of computational power. I mean, that's one way it's changed anyway that I want to focus on. How should education react to that change? So let's just be clear what the change has been. We are pretty much surrounded by what I would call ubiquitous computation. So, you know, and obviously this is a powering forward as we speak, but over the last few decades, we now have a situation where we all have pretty much universal all time access to high level computation uh, everywhere. And it's quite interesting to see what's happened to different fields given this. So, there are fields that, are, of course, are always you know, uh, being associated with computation, maths itself, physics, accounting, things like that. There are fields that are very new based on the machinery uh, being available, programming, data science, social media, things like that. And then there are many areas of endeavor that existed, have existed in all sorts of ways, but are now new to computation. And where we tend to go in very different directions, now we have this possibility of deploying massive computational power on them. So for the purpose of this discussion, I want to be very clear. We need to not confuse major effects of, the, of, of AI. And what often happens in discussion about education with AI is people focus on the first of these, the pedagogy. You know, can we replace teachers? Can we improve how we get across the subject to the students? Uh, but there's another key thing that I've been focused on, which is what we actually need to learn. As in, don't just assume the subject is OK, because the subject changes given that we have machinery to do some of the more mechanical parts of it. So AI does several things. It drives need for change, but it also provides the, the tools for that. And we need to be clear. So most of this talk, I want to talk about the subject more than the pedagogy. Um, the big question is, what is for the, for the human? What's for the computer in this sort of reset curricula? And I think one way to think about this that can be useful is to think about sort of what you need to survive in a modern society or even a less modern society today. I think it's very different from, from when I was 10 years old. 
I think you need a far greater computational understanding than you did at, at that time. Uh, you know, things are presented, just looking at pandemic, things are presented in a far more mathematical way. There's a certain basic understanding you need just to function at a reasonable level. There's the other end, which is what do we need our top value added contributors to provide? It isn't just knowing more. We can look stuff up on, on Google or on other places very easily. That's not the issue. It's, it's a sort of interesting mesh between uh, you know, our own intelligence and the increasing intelligence that our computers can provide. And then somewhere in the middle is what I would call subs subsistence. You know, if you want to be a, a manager in a company you know, making a de decent living, et cetera, et cetera, what are some basic things you need to be able to do? Like, for example, you need to be able to read and write. You've needed that for a long time. But what about the computational equivalent of that to be able to function in a sort of day-to-day -day job? Well, so look, my day job, as, as was uh, uh, suggested at the beginning, is you know we've been trying to build sort of the world's best computational technology for 30 plus years uh, with Mathematica and more latterly Wolfram Alpha and, and many other pieces. And the idea is to sort of automate as much as possible what one can do in computation at every level, not just solving a differential equation, but also how you present it in a notebook. Uh, we were in the inventors of notebooks, for example, and, and many things besides. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the day job. And the, um, you know, some of the things we try to do are to wire things together between different, uh, many different areas. So if I stick this on, we might not be able to do this immediately. But uh, um, the, um, uh, there we go. So this is another camera I have. And this is analyzing the picture, for example, and trying to figure out what my facial expression is, which is probably going to be not great, given that I'm not really looking at this camera. Um, and I might see if I can tweet the result, uh, and we'll see whether that actually worked. And you can look on my Twitter stream and see whether that actually managed to uh, to tweet the result or not. Um, so that's a typical sort of thing one's doing, wiring the computation up. And that's sort of the computer end of it. And another thing I think is fascinating is that one can now actually just get um, looked up in real time. And well, I've done a good a good length sequence here. But in the human genome, a sequence of uh, in the chromosomes to see what uh, what these base pairs, where that sequence appears. And in fact, I guess that sequence doesn't appear anywhere. Maybe I made slightly too long a sequence. Um, uh, and um, uh, the uh, this will basically look up. What have I done here? Something crazy. But uh, let me let me make a. Um, uh, Okay, nothing's working here. It's, I guess, too late in the evening for this. That'll probably give a very long sequence now. But what I'm trying to do is look up um, the human gene. There we go. So that was a long sequence of 30,000 places in the chromosomes where this appears. Uh, and it's amazing. I can just look that up because we have ubiquitous computation sort of, uh, you know, deployable immediately. So that's the machinery that we can work on. Why, why am I working on the educational side? Well, because I want to see the human step up to this and be able to really use that machinery as much as possible. You know, through history, when you've had an increased improvement in machinery, you tend then to see the humans needing to step up to a new level because the machinery is kind of taken over some of the basic types of things that the humans were doing. Now, in our educational structure, uh, there is a mainstream computational subject, which is called maths. And that's what you learn at school. And it takes up a huge amount of time. And the question is, are, is maths really driving the computational skills we need for an AI age amongst, amongst our students? And I'm going to argue, no, not really. I think it's probably about 80% the wrong subject at this point. And I just wanted to talk through where this is. The, the cleanest statement of this is to say, in real world math, computers do almost all the calculating. In educational math, people do almost all the calculating. And that is the fundamental problem at the heart of the maths crisis around the world. Unless those two are aligned, however well we teach the subject, it isn't going to be the right subject, in my view, and it's going to diverge at a rate of knots from what we actually need, however hard we pummel our students. So it's worth thinking about what the maths or computational process really is. Um, I think it's sort of a four-step process in which you define questions uh, with some specificity. You then abstract them to a computable form or a math form. You then try to take that construction in an abstract form and work out an answer. And this is the magic that for hundreds of years we've worked out a system of logic that allows us to do this in a very definitive way, much more definitive than just talking about it in English. 
And then we take the abstract answer and we kind of convert it back and say, you know, X equals three. Does that mean, you know, three hours of survival or whatever the, uh, the question was? And does that match with the sort of definition we had? So what's going wrong in a nutshell is that in education, we're spending almost all our time on step three by hand rather than doing what we ought to do, which is let's use much more of step three on a computer and let's use the, the humans to do much more and much harder steps one, two, and four. And in a sense, you know, I'm arguing that maths and computational thinking is a kind of a process in which you go up this helix repeatedly and you then try to kind of get the best answer until you're kind of satisfied you've got a sufficiently good answer to, to deal with the question you asked. And, you know, just a simple example, if you do something like at school, solving two linear uh, simultaneous equations, a pair of uh, simultaneous, equ you know, simultaneous linear equations, whichever way around you want to say it, um, the, um, that's a very standard problem you'd have at school, but you probably wouldn't have this, not very early on anyway. And, you know, the, the setup of this problem is very similar. The abstraction is very similar. It just happens to be a slightly harder, harder piece to it, so to speak. And it actually gets even worse than this because if you talk to your phone and you say, solve x cubed plus two equals two y and y minus x equals five. Uh, if Siri is feeling good, which it wasn't, uh, let me just try once again to do that and otherwise I will move on. But uh, uh, solve x cubed plus two equals two y and y minus x equals five. Okay, well, Siri for some reason is not behaving itself. But what I was trying to demo was the idea that you can talk to your phone and get this answer out, and uh, usually. And if you do that, you know, your phone has computed something that most students after 10 years of endeavor fail to be able to compute. And yet you can even talk to your phone and get it done. So you've got to ask why we're spending our time, our students' time teaching them that rather than something much deeper and, and higher level that they can deploy with the help of computers. Again, this goes through all of what you see in maths. You see educational headings like the innards, you know, inverting matrices and calculating, you know, using long division. Those are all about hand calculating. What I'm arguing for is much more of a contextual problems that need the whole computational process. You know, what's the best password? What's a perfect password for your login? Problem of most seven-year-olds. Uh, should I insure my laptop computer? Is insurance worthwhile? What's a beautiful shape? These apparently are fuzzier problems, but all things that I think are highly amenable to computational approach, but not the sort of thing that people think of as being maths, but yet what you do think of as using computation in the real world. So the big thing one really wants to think about here is if you remove the computer, you will remove almost all the context from the mathematics, which is modern contexts that have given mathematics the power over the last few decades to really move our lives forward in society. So if you strip out most of that context, you, you know, you, 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 if you strip out the computer, you will strip out most of that context from education and you'll end up with a very different subject. And it actually gets worse than that because as you think about what people learn in their mathematics education, they learn a computational tool set that's basically completely discrepant from what they'd use in real life. We see this a lot with data science. You know, what you do with 10 data points by hand with a normal distribution is not the way you'd solve a problem of how to analyze data with a million data points, which are much more complex with a computer. And so people are then learning the wrong tool set and they actually get pretty badly sidelined into using the wrong tool set, I think, in real life. And we've probably seen some effect of that in the financial crisis and so forth. So here's a typical problem I think you should be able to do with students. This is one where we divide the class up and say, why don't you cheat uh, half of you by typing heads and tails into a computer like I've done here? And let's have the other half actually flick the coins and note down the results. Now, if I cheat, the question is, can you tell I've cheated? And the answer is typically yes. We've run a bunch of tests on this, and uh, it doesn't seem to have, have worked very well. If I go and um, let me, I'm going to do, uh, let's see, um, let's, uh, let's do a random integer. Um, let's do, uh, um, what I'm going to do here is semi-cheat by basically write a little program for myself that will hopefully produce random numbers that look like I've actually done the experiment. So it's kind of like, uh, 
a smart person's cheat. Um, but uh, whoops. Um, uh, um, what have I done here? I've done that's uh, obviously uh, um, uh, um, done something. Uh, yeah, I've, I've done something goofy here. Let me um, uh, let me just do this. I think. And um, uh, okay, it's too late in the day. Um, that's my problem. I, I won't do this demo now because it'll take too long for this. But normally, what I do is I paste in a uh, um, a, a series of, of uh, random tests here, and you'll find these tests come out much better. So you can really tell whether people are cheating or not rather easily, at least if they're not smart enough to write a program, which this evening I appear really not to be able to do for some reason. Uh, so there are many pieces to what I would consider as computation. And data science and coding are part of that picture, but they are not the whole picture. I think it's really important to recognize this. It's great to be doing those things, particularly coding coming back. But coding is really much to do with step two of the abstraction and not so much the whole picture. And we need to educate people in all of this. This is obviously a revolution that's needed, not just an evolution. And that's a mistake that governments make around the world. They think if we just adjust a few things about mathematics, somehow we'll fix this problem. You won't. It's a bit like saying if you adjust your retail store, uh, adding a website here, you, you might somehow, you know, uh, see off the threat from Amazon, so to speak. But it doesn't quite work like that. And I think it doesn't in education either for what's what's happening. So kind of better deployment of the wrong subject really isn't going to fix this problem. And uh, we need a much more radical approach and a complete change of subject matter, assuming computers, in order to, to get that. So imagine you take this methodology, add 30 years of, of our experience with building uh, Wolfram and Mathematica and everything else, and try to figure out what the curriculum looks like assuming computers exist. That's sort of what we've been doing in, in computer-based math. And it's been going since about 2010. And you know, build a core com computational curriculum assumes computers exist. That's kind of what we're trying to do. And we've built various deliverables, including sort of modules um, projects, primers, and also an outcome. So I'll just very quickly flick up a module. The module which that example I showed is from is this, which is sort of an electronic electronic thing where you can actually do stuff um, and actually try different experiments and put data in and things. I, I, won't, I won't actually go through this, but um, you can actually see, you've kind of led through, walk through what to do in the hope that in the future, you can do this without any sort of scaffolding. Um, and there are teacher and student versions of those. But there's quite a set of deliverables one wants to define a practical new curriculum. Um, big key, key issue, we must have outcomes in our education that engender what I would call AI age thinking. We have to abstract out what we mean by thinking to an extent that we can not, not just have people process, go through a process to kind of uh, um, you know, try to make things, uh, you know, try to copy something that they've done. And making the outcomes clear on this is sort of a key thing that, we're, that we've been working on. So if we do all of this, what, what do we achieve? I think what we achieve is first-rate sort of human problem solvers, not third-rate pretend human calculators or computers. So work up a level from the machine, stop competing with what they do, optimize this human-computer hybrid decision-taking. Um, you know, we need to stand on the power of automation and that automation in past, you know, was to do with tractors and fields and agriculture. Now it's to do with quotes intelligence. Um, and that's sort of what we, you know, we need to work up from the machines, as I say. And just to round out, it's worth thinking about what happened with literacy. If you think back to the sort of early 19th century, most people thought the idea that, that the, the majority of the population could learn to read and write or that indeed that was a useful thing for them to do was, well, you know, it was kind of a nutty idea. They were too stupid, it was sort of unnecessary. I think we're in a similar era now with respect to computational literacy. And I think we can get most of the population to have some level of computational literacy. I think that will empower us in the same way as mass literacy empowered our societies. And I think now it is absolutely critical we do that so that people make better decisions in their life. Um, this is not just a thing, by the way, about schools. I think. We can set things up for adults in, in their jobs uh, and, uh, and when they're working as well to get past this barrier that, uh, that they have very little computational thinking at the moment. Anyway, that was my intro. Um, uh, uh, and um, I've written, obviously, a whole book about this, which was published last year, recently out in audio book. And um, that's, a, uh, that's a quick sort of quick summary of what we've been working on. Thanks very much.
Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Conrad. Some fascinating stuff, which I'm going to offer a comment on uh, more later. I realize maybe it's, although I'm in the U.S. now, so I've been getting up early rather than it being late in the day, but I've managed to make it to the U.S. for a month for first time in two years. And so I two things I forgot to do at the beginning. One's just a, one was to introduce the LearnTech Meetup, which is this idea that we just a series of conversations around learning and technology and AI. And this was a perfect presentation for that. We founded it, uh, I'm the CEO of LearnerShape. We founded it with Mindstream AI, which is how we met Conrad because he's been working in some of the activities that we've just described. He and his organization have been working with Mindstream AI, who is our partner. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention, which Silva put in the chat, is we will do Q&A um, in about 20 minutes at the end of this. Um, and so if you have questions, uh, we're going to use those that are in the chat and, um, and try to do it that way, although we'll let people engage in a spoken way with the questions. But please put them in the chat first, and we'll use that to, to manage it. So our second speaker is Maria Del Rio Shanona. She's a postdoc at the just moved to the Complexity Science Hub in Vienna, although I understand she's still based in the UK at Oxford at the moment. Um, yes. Maria, look forward to your presentation. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, the invitation and uh, for everyone uh, here and for the organizer. So um, I'm going to talk about how AI can drive the skills revolution. And uh, to introduce this, and you know, since I know it's very early some places and late other times, I want actually to use uh, the fact that it's online and that we can make use of a chat to play a game. And of course, with this game, uh, I plan to introduce uh, part of the ideas of this talk. So what I'm going to ask you, uh, the game is very, very simple. Uh, I'm going to put a picture and I'm going to ask you to guess the era or historic period the, the picture represents. If you guess the era or historic period, it's one point. If you guess the century of the picture or the years, it's two points. Um, please use the chat to answer. The highest score wins. After posting the picture, I'm going to wait a few uh, seconds and I'm going to put the answer. So please keep uh, your scores. And I'm going to ask everyone to participate. Or if, if you can, please do it. Otherwise, it's a bit awkward. I, so yeah, uh, are, are the... Uh, rules of the game clear and is the chat working and everything the chat okay. seems to be working perfect I'm clear enough to me perfect okay so this is the first picture great okay well the right answer for this one is uh, uh, hunter gatherers uh, sorry, I saw. Is, is the are the pictures being too small? Was uh, this one okay? Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm seeing it. Okay. Okay. Great. Perfect. I'll I'll I'll, I'll give a, a little bit more time for the next one. So this is a picture of Hunter the Gatherers in the Stone Age. That's uh uh ten k years before Christ. The next picture. So I'm gonna give a few more, more seconds. Okay, so yes, this is uh, feudalism, Middle Ages, Dark Ages. It runs from the 9th century to the 15th century. So if you got the centuries, that's two points. If Middle Ages, Dark Ages, that's, that's one point. Okay, this is the next picture. Yeah, I see some people guessing the, the years. So yes, this is uh, the famous uh, industrial revolution. This is a picture of factory workers, uh, some machinery, and it's uh, 18th to 19th uh, century, the industrial revolution. And this one, this one, so I'm gonna give you a few more time because this actually is very, very tricky. It's probably the trickiest we have, but, but give it a shot because this tends to be the, the tiebreaker here. Perfect. So this is actually uh, 19th to 20th century, and this is a picture of an elevator operator. So this used to happen when elevators uh, ran, well, they needed an operator, they weren't automatic. 
Um, so this is actually an occupation that has been automated. There's a, there's a story here, if, if you'd like to follow, it's very interesting. And the last picture would be uh, this one. Yes, exactly. This is uh, 2020 and this is the 21st century. Uh, so it's uh, hopefully it's just a century, but let's 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 see how it goes. Uh, okay, so why did I show all of these pictures? So the thing is, in all of these pictures, I showed someone working. Every picture was about labor, and just by showing how people worked, you were able to guess or roughly guess the historic time period. The idea behind this is that the labor market adapts and evolves and workers adapt and we need different skills in different time periods. And of course, at the moment, we're experiencing a, a new change. So how can we understand this? Well, one way we did so, uh, in, in a piece of work uh, with uh, Penny and, and Doin, what we did is we focused on occupations and their work activities given by ONET. So we have things like lawyers, supervised personnel, similar the way that doctors do. Doctors diagnose health conditions even though lawyers don't. So by understanding the overlap in work activities between occupations, we could come up with a way of understanding similarity with, uh, with, within occupations. So for example, here um, we would link um, lawyers with, um, with fire workers, with policemen, uh, because they're all related to law enforcement, while you wouldn't link a farmer with a medical doctor. And we came up with this network where nodes are occupations and links join occupations that have a high share of work activity. We see that network clusters around, so you tend to see that similar occupations are in the same broad classification system. For example, production, construction, and installation is on the top, uh, sorry, in the bottom. At the top, you have here, for example, healthcare, and uh, you have office administrative support, food and servicing. And what we found out here is that work activities are best at predicting occupational transitions. So why are we interested in occupational transitions? And by the way, we tried other things. We tried skills and many things, but it's, it's really what you do at work that allows you to be resilient and to adapt. So yeah, occupational mobility. And in this case, I'm gonna talk about automation, but this is a, a story about adaptation. How can we adapt to new changes? So the way I'd like to introduce this is say, you know, imagine a high school student asks you, what occupation should I choose? Uh, should I be a statistical assistant or should I be an electrician? You do your research and you find out the statistical assistants have a high automation probability while electricians have a low automation probability. Based on this information, you might be thinking, well, I should, I should tell the student to be an electrician, you know, that way they won't be unemployed. Well, this work is about why that would be the wrong answer. And it would be the wrong answer because we'll be focusing on one number instead of acknowledging the complexity of the problem. And the thing is, the problem looks more like this. So in this uh, network, nodes are occupation and edges denote uh, job transitions. So we have electricians that are blue, meaning that they're unlikely to be automated, but they're surrounded by red occupation. So when this, if these workers get displaced by automation, they might uh, displace electricians. On the other hand, statistical assistants are red, so they're highly likely to be automated, but they're surrounded by blue occupations. So, you know, the skills they have may allow them to transition to other occupations and hence be safe uh, from automation. So we build an agent-based model of the labor market. And what we did is we predict, well, we, we assess the impact of automation of occupations uh, at using their unemployment rate and long-term unemployment rate. And we, what we find basically is that you need to acknowledge the complexity of a problem. We're, we're in a world that's in constant change. Skills might allow us, if you have the right skills, uh, going back to Congress talk, um, talk if, if we have the actual uh, skills and capabilities, then we will be able to, to transition. So uh, one thing I, I want to highlight that we did in this work is that we looked at retraining. So as I said, we focused on unemployment rate and long-term unemployment. This is at the aggregate level that we also did at the occupation level. So we introduced an automation shock that would display some workers. It would also create some jobs. And we looked at uh, retraining in a way increases the connectivity of the network because we have new links because you enable occupation transitions. And what this does is it helps free bottlenecks. So you see, and we compare different methods of, uh, let's say, hypothesis for retraining. 
is that the new retraining, which is the dashed green line, has a higher increase in unemployment rate and long-term unemployment rate when you hit with a shock than when you have the random retraining or, or, or other or retraining the susceptible, right? So just by adding some retraining, you're able to mitigate this effect. Uh, okay, so now let's let's focus about, so it's, it's oh, and by the way, one thing I, I want to highlight here is that here we model retraining by adding connectivity, but to understand, to really have this edges, we need to understand which skills enable transitions. And this can be done with AI in several ways, such as, you know, uh, natural language processing and vacancies, uh, you know, running classifiers and seeing what's really uh, predicting those job transitions. But okay, so then it, this comes down to learning and adaptation, to having skills that will allow us to adapt. Uh, but how, how shall we do this? What, what skills have, can we te teach? So when we talk about adaptation, perhaps the best example is to think about Lamarckian, sorry, evolution, right? So when you talk about evolution, there's, um, you know, we know it's Darwin and evolution, but there's other methods that we can think of evolution. One of them is Lamarckian adaptation. So uh, Lamarck had this hypothesis that, you know, inheritance, that there's inheritance of acquired characteristics. So we have this idea of uh, giraffes that they use their neck a lot, and then they'll inherit this. Well, this doesn't really happen in the in, in the natural world, but it does happen in a sense with cultural evolution because we tend to teach the skills that are currently in high demand or we predict to have high demand if we guess them right. Of course, we can be teaching our students wrong, but if we get it right, we could teach them what's in, what, what, you know, what allows us right now to work or try and predict what will be in high demand. And this is very useful when you know the landscape. This is training a specialist. You know your problem, you know what you want to do, and then you can advance fast. So, you know, this is in a way the landscape. If you know how the world is going to change, you can put your path in and just go straight through really fast with, you know, a specialist or Lamarck in adaptation. However, another way of adaptation is the one we're more familiar with, which is the Darwinian adaptation, where we have a diverse set of individuals. And then uh, through natural selection, species keep uh, the traits that are fit for a particular environment. And this is more of a generous approach, right? Different skills. And then you test which one is, is, um, is actually useful for what you want. And this type of adaptation is good when the landscape is unknown. So here we have a rocky path and you need to try several things. Because, uh, you know, the, the Lamarckian might not, you know, if you go straight, you'll hit a rock. So we have to try out different things. It's a bit slower, but it allows for resilience. It allows for when there's a shock that you did not foresee, you can still adapt towards it. So what I'd like to uh, to We seem to have Maria frozen. Let's give her, I assume others can still, can hear me? Yes, we can. We can hear you. Yes, we can, yes. All right, I'm gonna give her another 15 seconds or so, and if it doesn't come back, I will, um, I'll turn to my presentation and then we'll hopefully come back to the end of Maria's. All right, see, Maria may be coming back in. I'm going to briefly, um, I have a short presentation about what we're doing at, at LearnerShape with Skills and AI. I will make that now, and hopefully during that time, Maria will rejoin, and we will be able to um, see the end of her presentation. So LearnerShape's mission started with the idea of the question, what if we could use a variety of AI methods to provide a portable representation of every individual to inform their lifeline, lifetime learning journey? So make education better, but maybe different. A lot, a lot along the lines of what Conrad had to say is use the modern tools and make the education system fit them. In doing that, skills have been central to what we're doing. And we've thought a lot about how we talk about skills and the best way to interact with a computer in terms of talking about skills. So here's somebody who's 
uh, a data scientist with some skills that would actually be quite useful to errors involving NLP. And this explanation that he's giving is one that I would find uh, quite intelligible in an interview, and I'd probably be quite interested in uh, proceeding with him. I went to a skills framework, uh, which is uh, quite an effective skills framework. It's one of the ones we've looked at called Skills Framework for the Information Age, Sophia, and tried to create a, uh, a description of the same skill set. And this was about as close as I could get. And it, it's not bad, but it's very hard for a human to understand. And the problem with that is, is there isn't just Sophia. There are a lot of skills frameworks. Probably the biggest one is ONET that Maria mentioned that she uses for her research. And it's a very useful framework for categorizing people into occupations and is widely used. Um, but it can be, it, it isn't used everywhere. And there are many other frameworks. ESCO is the big European framework. About eight months ago, the World Economic Forum brought together a group of people to create a, a new skills taxonomy. I mentioned Sophia, the European e-competence framework is another one. These are what we call skills taxonomies. And within the taxonomies, there are different concepts. Um, skills is the one that we focused on as a term. Um, Maria was talking about tasks as being a key way to define uh, what makes people effective. There are a lot of other terms. Um, ONET, for example, divides up uh, its analysis into skills, abilities, and knowledge as represented by activities and tasks. And these are all useful terms, but we find them difficult to parse. And the approach that LearnerShape has taken is to call everything a skill um, and let the, uh, let the machine intelligence draw the necessary connections. So the way we started to think about this, the way that got us thinking about this was some uh, UK research at Nesta that used job market data, CVs and job descriptions to see proximities of skills, a, a little bit like the skills, the jobs map that Maria drew, but this was skills proximity within the data and see association between skills that way. And it occurred to us that um, proximity in a CV or a job description Maybe just proximity in the language is, uh, is an equally good proxy. And what I mean by that is taking the concept of word embeddings, which is a, a way of putting a word, making a mathematical representation of a word, you can produce sense out of that. Um, some of you may have seen this, um, uh, this uh, equation, king minus man plus woman. Does anybody know what the answer to that is? Or there are many, there are both, but unanswer. Uh, the, the answer that is generally given is queen. Um, and the reason that this works is the vector in a vector space um, uh, of a word embeddings from king to queen is similar to the vector from man to woman. And so you just move the direction of um, between the two um, vectors by doing that addition and subtraction. This is a two-dimensional representation. These things are usually higher dimensional, 100 dimensions or more. And the way that a significant recent advance in this, in 2017, Google introduced what's called the transformer architecture, which allows very sophisticated language models that represent words, concepts, sentences um, in very high dimensional representations. The one that we use a lot and that's been very successful is another Google model called BERT that uses 768 dimensional representations of concepts that, uh, in, in natural language. And so we've applied those to skills for various tasks like connecting, uh, saying, if you have this skill of a given description, look at content, look at a large library. We have 75, 80,000 pieces of content in our library. Pick out the pieces of content in that library that relate to that skill. Or if you have a set of skills, which job would be best for you? So, but this is, it doesn't get you all the way there to just be able to say, well, the AI can look at the name of a skill because for example, you have a skill like libraries and I can tell the AI tech we've looked uh, to, to look at libraries and to pick out the content in our content, uh, that library of 75, 80,000 pieces of content, which of those are gonna teach about libraries. But the, the problem with that is, is that in a map of skills, uh, 
there is more information than just the name of the skill. So libraries can mean a programming library. Um, it can mean uh, how to organize information in the library in the sense that I just referred to our library of 75 to 80,000 pieces of information. Or it could be an architectural concept of how you build a library. It has really a lot of weight because of all the books and you have to do special reinforcements of the floor. These are very different sets of skills. And so it turns out that the AI works a lot better if it has this kind of graph-based information. So coming back to what I said at the beginning, in order to allow people to talk in common language, we can't quite, we, we can get there, but it does better if we allow people to build their own networks. So any, this, this, um, this graph at the right of the slide I built this morning, it's simple, um, but our AI would work just fine with it. Our AI can use any network, any graph of skills like that and parse it to, um, to identify content and see relationships and so forth. So we put this code, a lot of, some of our code's proprietary, but a lot of it's open source and we put it on GitHub here. And we're, if, if you're interested in it, please check it out. We're also interested in talking to people about it. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and Maria is back. Uh, welcome back, Maria. I hope you don't mind. We, uh, in your absence, we decided that I would do my presentation and we would let you then finish yours. So hopefully people remember where you left off and we, you can dive back in and, and finish off and then we'll leave a few minutes for Q&A. Perfect. That's, I'm, I'm very happy you did this because I actually didn't realize when my connectivity went off and just finished. Um, <laughs> so that was, uh, but where was I when connection lost? You were just going up a rocky hill. Um, okay. Okay. So I got, I got through most of it. Um, great. Perfect. Sorry about that. I, uh, I missed it. Um, I should share screen. Yeah. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. yes. Perfect. Okay, sorry. So I was going through the winning adaptation. And what I was saying is that when you have diversity, you're better able to adapt uh, through a rocky landscape, right? So if there's something we couldn't predict, such as COVID-19, and we're going in a straight path with low market adaptation, all of a sudden we break down. But if we have diversity, then so, uh, you know, talking about learning, retraining, and adaptation, uh, we should be forward-looking and learn uh, skills that um, will likely help us in the future. But we also should allow for diversity. Different people can learn different skills. And diversity allows us to better uh, adapt towards unknown challenges. Uh, AI, in, in, in the way uh, Mari was, was explaining, can uh, help us understand a bundle of skills uh, that can facilitate this adaptation. And this relates to, you know, also the holder winning in Lamar can generalist and specialist approach uh, can can help us understand that. Um, and just final remarks, uh, labor market evolution is complex. Single numbers don't tell the full story. This is what I hope to portray with, with the network and um, how you know it's adaptation is, is complex. Uh, I do believe networks are a powerful tool for understanding how labor force adapts. There's many others. Uh, I do believe data can help us understand these transitions we use the census data for this network, but there's also the possibility of using online data, CV trend, like um, CV trend, uh, yeah, CV, CV uh, data can help us understand job transitions as well. And I think there's an opportunity for collaboration between academia and, uh, and other companies uh, with this data. And, you know, we should do direct the learning, see where we think the labor market is going and also allow for some diversity and give flexibility to people. And I would just say thank you again. Apologies for the connectivity issues. I'd like to send uh, everyone a remote hug. I know it's been a tough year for everyone. And I'll leave you with some references. And that just I'd like to uh, thank everyone for coming and thank the organizers as well. Great. Well, thank you very much, Maria. Maria. I'm going to, I'm going um, to uh, go through some questions some from questions. the chat um, and starting from the beginning, I'm going to try to do at least three. There's a couple for, for Conrad at the beginning and then uh, one, two for Conrad and one for Maria. I'll start with Matthew Emrick, who said, if students learn how to use what is really a complex calculator, how will they gain a deeper understanding of the subject? 
If students can only do what computers allow them to do, how will computers be programmed with new capabilities? A challenge to your... Okay, gosh. Uh, um, let's see, where do I start from? You know, it's like the government people who say to me sometimes, you know, won't we kind of do mindless button pushing if we allow people to use computers? Is that what's happened in the outside world in science and engineering in the last few decades? I don't think so. I think what's happened is the problems have got vastly more complex <clears throat> as people can deploy more computation onto them. And there's no reason not to replicate that in education. I think the conceptual understanding required now in many areas of work, engineering and the like, is vastly higher than it ever was before because of computers. So the idea that computers somehow reduce the complexity of problems that you tend to confront is, in my view, fundamentally wrong. Uh, of course, you can misuse them. Anybody can misuse nice tool sets to do something mindless. But I don't think that's what you ought to be doing as long as you really shift the subject. If what you do is you take the existing subject I mean, in fact, when Wolfram Alpha came out in 2009, I gave a talk entitled, Is it cheating to use Wolfram Alpha for your maths homework? Well, depends what the homework is. If the homework is as mindless as it is at the moment, then yes, usually it is. If the homework steps up to the next level so that you're trying to understand much more complex issues and you're trying to do more realistic problems, then the answer is, uh, no, it's not cheating to use it. Why would it be cheating? It's a tool set that you got out there. Now, in terms of the issue about, you know, who can program things like Mathematica, right? Who can write the code for that? Again, I don't really agree with this because it's like saying, if we have a very narrow pipeline that we have now for people who might enjoy mathematics, I mean, at the moment, I think we're chucking a lot of people out of the educational system who are good computational thinkers. They just don't happen to like solving quadratic equations by hand. So they get bored or fed up or they don't know why they're doing it, so they give up and we lose them. I think that the chance of capturing many more people when they have something to do with their lives and they can actually deploy the computation on something they are actually interested in at the outset, it's not abstract first. I think the chance of those people, a, a fraction of those people getting excited about what's under the bonnet, what's under the hood, is much higher than it is now. And I think you'll end up actually with more people who want to then dig into what the innards are like and actually learn what to do with the insides, you know, how to build the car rather than how to drive it. But starting with the idea that the mass subject is, is, is building, you know, building your car, I mean, that was true 100 and something years ago when cars were new, it isn't true now. Most people are drivers, they're not builders, and that's what we need. But you get a certain fraction of those people who want to go and look, look deeper, and I'm all for that. I mean, final point on this. I'm incredibly positive about people who want to study a subject because they are interested in it. So it doesn't matter whether it's ancient Greek or you know Latin poetry or maths, hand calculating maths, you know traditions, the background, you know the history of hand calculating. I'm positive about all those things. I just don't think we should force the world's population to do it if it's not justified. And that's what I think we're doing at the moment. I think it's got dire consequences if we continue. So I don't know if that's slightly um, it was a, I'm not sure I hit at all the things I wanted to hit out there, but hopefully that's some of the thinking that I have at least behind that. So the next question was related to that, and I'll, um, I'm not sure you'll, you'll have other, whether you'll have other points to add, but I'll read it out from Catherine, who said, loved your four-step breakdown, which I, I think she means define, abstract, compute, interpret, which I also love. Um, and she said, if students of using computation are going uh, are going to use it as most people drive cars without ne necessarily understanding how to calculate from scratch, what proportion of mathematicians, um, like car mechanics or engine builders, do we still need to fix things when computation breaks down? So how much? So, so, so I think you've got to be very, it's like, okay, take the car analogy, right? How fast can you drive around a corner near Oxford before you skid your car off the side of the road? Uh, well, you can go study the physics of that. And, you know, I know a little bit more about the physics of that than the average person in the population. But you know what? In the end, you get to experience what you can do and how you, there are various ways you might get that experience. But in the end, you get experience how to drive the car. 
And I feel it's very same way here. You've got to get experience of when computation works, when it doesn't work, what tends to go wrong, what goes wrong with which methods. None of that are we doing, basically, in our current maths education. We are, you know, we're getting people to check stuff by hand, which they can't check when they're building a bridge because the compu you know, computation is too complicated. We don't give them most of the ways of verification that they need. We don't give them much instinct for real problems because they're doing too simple a problem. So we're actually stripping out all of that expertise, in a sense, that they desperately need. Experience, I would call it. And so I think, actually, by having more realistic, more complex, more real problems that are computer-based, that match what we want to do in the real world, we will build that experience much better. And the chance of people screwing up will actually go down somewhat. Now, there are times when you actually explicitly need to know how the machinery works. And we will still need people who know that. But you know, most of the time, you can't. I don't really know how my computer works. I mean, do, do you not use a computer because you don't really know how it works? Um, you, it's not a way you can work with automation. That's the nature of it. What you have to understand is how you get experience of when the thing goes wrong, what you do with it. You know, a good example of how this works is um, the training of airline pilots, the training of pilots in general. Been massively successful in cutting accidents. That's not because you can predict uh, how everything's going to work. And sometimes there are catastrophic failures, like the 737 MAX, for example. But it, what it does is it, we're giving people situational experience far more with simulators and so forth than they've ever had before. And so therefore, they know what to do in different circumstances and have practiced that. And that's sort of what I think we need to do to eliminate errors. So, so you've got to be very different between how the machine works on the inside and how you understand how to handle verification when you're using um, AI or other machinery. And that's something we need to learn and build into our education as a key part of it. Thank you, Conrad. I, I find, personally find that very persuasive. I'm going to uh, skip over a question from Memo Flynn with apologies, who I've just noticed got the, uh, the queen answer correct, I think, before I gave it. So congratulations. I know she's asked a question before in our meetup. We'll come back to it if we can. I want to go to, on to a question for Maria that came out during her, um, her talk from Chris Hall, who said, uh, how do we link educational ability to success in the workplace? And Conrad may have a view on this as well, but what would you suggest is the best way to have the skills we need as individuals in a country? Um, and, and do GCSEs and A-levels have any value in this new world of work, or should education be more skills-based? Right. So I, I think it's a great question. I think you know we have tests because we have, well, maybe we don't have that many alternatives. But if you ask me the way to judge how good the education is, I'd focus on their capability of adapting, right? So, you know, maybe, though I agree with, with, with what Carmen has said, maybe why we solve integrals in school is because they allow us to think, and that will in turn be useful in the future, right? Of course, you could, I think there's many better ways of doing that. But if, if I had to give an answer of what makes us, uh, what makes education good is the possibility of adapting and the possibility of transitioning. So if we had data on a CV and, I, and you know, someone report this was my grade in school and I could see the history of their jobs and how much they adapted. And, you know, if it was an adaptation that was related perhaps with like an increase in wage, then we could actually give a better understanding of are grades actually a prediction of flexibility or they're just a very narrow mind? Uh, that, that would be my answer. I think, I think it's about flexibility and adaptation. And I think it's actually a great research question that I'd love to be able to answer more in detail with the right data. I could add something to that quickly. Um, I mean, one of the things we've done is, um, I'll just very quickly perhaps show you, I've, uh, we built a, I don't know whether I'm sharing this, but we built a, um, uh, um, uh, an outcomes tree for the computation end of this. And this is very different to, I think, what you'd find in most maths things. And one of the key things here is to try and get the set of outcomes you actually want to have properly enunciated. I, I'm, it's pretty horrific if you look at what's done around the world in maths curricula, for example. You know, it's like they're a linear list that doesn't really make sense. It's all about the specific, you know, to use my own example, can you solve a quadratic or not? It doesn't separate out equations, the tool set, how you might understand the errors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got to get our outcomes straight. Now, how do you then, 
what's the point of the tests, etc. There are several points that get mixed up, right? One is to actually figure out whether the student is learning anything. Then there's a separate point, which is to, you know, to, to, to give a hit list for which universities you can get into and so forth. I think largely we are testing a very narrow range of abilities right now. And then we get start end up with quotas for getting into universities and things like that, because we find that the ways we're measuring people aren't right. So I would advocate in the longer term, I think we do still need a way of evaluating people, but the broader it can be. And I mean, I would say what we really ought to do is attach a big computational data set to every student that represents the 10, 15, 20 years of their existence uh, educationally. And then you need a Wolfram Alpha like style for inquisiting, you know, what, you know, asking the particular sets of things you want to know about. If you're Oxford University admitting somebody, you may have a different set of criteria than if you're, uh, you know, an employer wanting to employ somebody for a different job. But so there's a much bigger data set. And you are then, as the sort of person asking the question, deciding what the metrics are, rather than this thing where we decide that for 10 years of their life, they'll learn something. For two hours, they're going to take an exam, and we're going to judge everything on that. There are very few jobs that match the style of mugging up something for an exam and taking it. I think being a barrister is one job that's like an exam. You know, you mug it up for the court case, and then you have to deliver it in real time for two hours. If you're a researcher, it doesn't match exams at all. So we should have assessments that somehow match what you're supposed to be doing afterwards, both in subject and style. Yeah, thanks for that. And I, I was going to come back to Mimo Flynn's question, and you've basically uh, you've answered it with that framework that you put up, Conrad. I think, which was, what do you see are the core elements of computational literacy? As you said, easy email and using apps for productivity, shopping. You've gone beyond that to a set of skills. But I, I, uh, I I'll that, put it that in I chat think as well, so um, people can can get it. But I take it that was the purpose of that framework is to say, what are these key skills for yeah. being computational? And, and they're quite hard to, um, it's quite hard to write it down because there are very, not, you know, when you think about what do you need to know about a particular topic, if you think there's a machine doing some of it, there are many different levels. And what do you need to know about machine learning? Well, there's a five-year-old answer to that, which is roughly when you'd use it and how I might use it. I mean, you can teach most, maybe not five-year-old, 10-year-olds. They could be using machine learning in schools through lots of exciting projects. There's a totally different level of knowing about machine learning, you know, building new neural nets, and you know, it's a completely different level. So there's different levels of knowing for most of these things. Traditional curricula don't understand that because if you're doing everything by hand, you can just sort of list it down as a long list. You can't do that when you've got a machine in the middle, and that's where they get very confused between them. What we've tried to do is separate this out into 11 dimensions with different layers to try and uh, encapsulate it, but it's, it's, it's hard. I think we've done a, a fairly a fairly good job to try and achieve that. Well, thanks so much. So I'm going to keep to the, um, the policy of our meetup of doing it within an hour's time, so to be efficient with people's time. Uh, I'm really happy that the quality of the, dis the quality of this presentations and follow-up discussion by the speakers has um, kept up the, tr uh, the short, three uh, three event tradition, which we will continue of this meetup, of being really excellent. And I really appreciate your time, Conrad, and your time, Maria, and the, the time of, of all the participants who joined us today to listen in. Um, we will be uh, we'll be posting a video of this, um, which uh, based upon previous tech will show the speakers and not not everybody, um, although uh, uh, your, your face could appear. Um, and so um, with that, uh, please get in touch with, um, get in touch if you want to know more about uh, this. We have a place to sign up for the Learn Tech Meetup group and we'll be holding future events. Thanks everyone for joining. I'm just going to add the Meetup group link onto the chat now. So if you want to join that, uh, we tend to uh, post our events first on that. So you'll be first to hear it. And like Maurice said, I will share this recording with everyone uh, this week. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Nice to talk to you all. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers. Bye.